tardes. Nuestra siguiente conferencia nos va, eh, vamos a presentar a Venkatesh Prasad. Él trabaja en el Centro de Innovación y Desarrollo de, de Ford en Palo Alto. Entonces vamos a darle la bienvenida, vamos a dar un aplauso a Venkatesh Prasad. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Is it better now? Can you hear me? Oh, good. So, well, this is an awesome place. Look at all this energy all around us. And uh, so thank you for taking time out of this fun all around and coming here. And so I hope to share with you my journey of fun and, and uh, fun with cars, but fun with mobility. And really how all of us as... Um, developers as creators can add value to this world we live in, right? And so I'm going to share some thoughts with you. Um, my focus is going to be on open innovation platforms, open source platforms, but also open source hardware platforms. Um, and so it's a combination of open source software and open source so hardware that I'll be speaking about. I'll give you a few examples of uh, what goes behind this technology, and of course, some of the fun associated with it. Okay, so um, I'm gonna cover quite a bit. It's um, a little bit about why we are doing this, and, and of course, then getting into what it means for all of us. Um, we live in this large planet here with lots of people, seven billion people, and it's going up, right, the population, and If you look around the world, not many of us own cars. Only one in 10 maybe owns a car. Yeah, yeah. Most of us don't own a car. Is, this, is it better? Yeah, yeah. so uh, we live in a, in a world that's growing in population um, and it's really difficult for us to move around in most parts of the world. Um, most of us don't own cars and many more of us own bicycles. So as we look at, at the world and look at mobility, our question is how do we go from A to B? How do we go around? Maybe in a car, but often in a bicycle. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of what's, what we're doing. We, of course, build cars at Ford, no question. But we also are doing something very interesting now with bicycles. So it's cars and bicycles coming together and everything in between. Um, There's a lot of applications that can be built on bicycles, believe it or not. It's not just the physical bicycle or how it can fold and go into a car, but it's also having integration between your bicycle and smartphones and maybe wearables so you can get a better sense of how to go from A to B. I'm going to give you a, a few examples. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, quite a bit on how we can feel the future by prototyping and experimenting. Um, and I'm going to emphasize the role of open source um, software. Uh, let me start with a uh, small video clip. Hopefully you can hear it. Um, and, and this has to do, uh, was done by a colleague of ours. Let me get here.
Okay. 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 Not the embedded file. Go ahead. Haptic. Yeah, 3D printed. Why? Okay, but do you prefer to I can talk. I mean I think it's coming, right? That's okay, I, I'll just speak. I think this is pretty good if it the, but there's no will the sound come through the other one? Yeah. Let's try it one more time. Minimize, yeah. Okay. Just minimize a little bit. Yeah, go there. Yeah. No? Don't worry. Did you hear the sound? That's okay. Sound, huh? no. Don't worry, I won't speak, I won't bother with the sound. But for the next one, it'll be good to have sound, you know? Okay. Right? I think it's there, no? We won't worry. So, let me tell you what he did here. So what you just saw Zach Nelson doing was to create a haptic shift knob, right? It's all on GitHub. You can go up to GitHub, get all the repos, and then modify it and improve the file and do what you want to. It's a lot of fun. It doesn't mean that just because you put it in GitHub that you don't have any intellectual property. Zach also got a patent out of it. So you can actually get a patent and have things on GitHub, which is actually pretty cool. And so I'm going to give you a sense of how you can do both and, and, and really a benefit um, from, from doing that. Um, from the standpoint of how Ford um, reaches out and, and builds applications on cars, what we're trying to do is to have two types of programs. One is to support the development of products, and that's through AppLink. Um, and if you, want, if you use AppLink and the APIs associated with AppLink, you can then go create applications for Ford cars. But let's say you don't have a Ford car or you're coming from a different uh, organization and, and you want to have applications from cell phones, smartphones, working on your car that's not a Ford vehicle, you can use SDL and build your applications on top of that. It doesn't matter who, which car company you are part of, you can use SDL and make it work for your car. If you, don't, if you don't want to build for product, but you just want to prototype quickly like what Zach Nelson did with the shift knob, then you can use OpenXC. OpenXC is an open source platform that's been placed under the Creative Commons attribution. So it's, it's really important to note that because OpenXC is under the Creative Commons attribution, you can copy it, you can modify it, you can commercialize it, without any royalty, without any payments back to, in this case, Ford, um, all you have to do is to attribute the source, which is, of course, a courtesy to do anyway. So it's very powerful to have um, an open source tool um, and a whole platform that's been placed under the Creative Commons. 
Now, why am I speaking about this? I'm, I'm sort of speaking about this because you know, cars are interesting for me. I happen to work at Ford Motor Company having fun. But the most important thing is there's lots of cars on the planet today. There's about a billion cars, trucks, and buses on the planet. And every car has a number of sensors and a number of actuators. And so we have a great opportunity as scientists, as engineers, as developers, as policy makers, to make use of these sensors that are there already, to make use of these actuators that are already there on our roads. So if you look at a billion cars, trucks, and buses, and each car, truck, and bus having two wiper blades, then there are two billion wiper blades, more or less, maybe three billion if you add the wiper blade in the back. So you have a lot of wiper blades in cars, and somehow if you can connect these wiper blades to your phones and to the cloud, you can get a very good sense of whether something, the road is, is wet or not, whether it's raining or not. So there's a number of ways to sense the environment, to sense the world, um, using what you already have today. So I'm going to give you a couple of those examples. Um, as I speak of open source platforms, I want to sort of draw the importance of ecosystems. So GitHub, I just sh showed you a few minutes ago, is a great way to place your open source code. But what it also does, it gives you access to a large community of like-minded people, people with similar interests. It's kind of like a bird, it's, it's like going to a, um, um, a, 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 to a community where people have shared interests. It's like being part of, uh, a, a, you know, flocking to, uh, to birds with similar interests, if you will. Um, so it's, it's important to bear in mind the value of those ecosystems. Um, Zach Nelson, who built the haptic shift knob, used this platform called OpenXC. Um, it's really a way to get data out of cars. And there are a number of sources today, a number of ways to get data out of cars, a number of onboard diagnostics modules and platforms. Um, but most of them are not in the open source. And if they are in the open source, they're not in the open source for both software and hardware. They might be open source for software, but blocked for hardware. Or there might be some open source Arduino kinds of hardware um, uh, options, but the software would not be open source. So what OpenXC gives you is both open source software and open source hardware. And that's very, very powerful. Um, if you want to start developing applications for cars, you don't require, there's a long list of what you don't require. You don't require a car, you don't require a smartphone. You really just require a laptop. You can start doing that today. You can get an emulator. You can get all the code you need. Of course, you need internet connection. Um, but you can start writing, developing concepts, start writing Android apps, start writing iOS apps. Um, just start looking at, at how you might create a good user experience. Um, so in effect, what has happened is tools like OpenXC have reduced the barriers to innovation. It used to be very hard to do anything with cars because cars were complicated, right? And they still are. They're very, very complicated. But with toolkits that allow you to access car data and then bring, them, bring the data onto your laptop, you can now innovate without having to necessarily have access to a car. Um, you can start innovating without knowing the details of your car. And that gives a very, very rich environment because the barriers to innovating with products like ours have begun to go down. And we know this from our everyday experience of mobile platforms. There's so many apps on, on mobile platforms that wouldn't have happened if you had to go back to the manufacturer to create applications. If only Apple created applications, if only Google created applications, there wouldn't be so many applications, right? You have so many apps because essentially anyone can create an app. And so with the democratization, with the easy access to technologies, um, easy access to APIs, easy access to 3D printers, you can start creating applications um, and add value to, to platforms. So um, I'll spend a couple of minutes uh, more on OpenXC. It's a really interesting platform because within a car there are very complex networks. There are complex communication networks and they communicate with a sequence of ones and zeros that are quite complicated, hard for anyone else to understand. 
what OpenXC does is it converts that string of ones and zeros, the hexadecimal code, into a JSON string. Once you have a J JavaScript object notation, it's a semantic notation. It's a notation in a natural language. So you know how to interpret the data, and then you can start doing very interesting things about it with, with, with that data. So in this case, we say that when it goes through a translator, you get this string that says the vehicle speed is 23.1 kilometers. You can then do something with that, that information. So uh, about a few uh, years ago, a couple of developers used a, a, a Ford vehicle. They plugged in an onboard diagnostics module, one of these OpenXC modules. Um, and then they collected this JSON string, and they drove around Manhattan in New York City. And through that, they were able to get a whole lot of vehicle traces. And they used an open source map database. And they were able to create this in a matter of one day. And they didn't know much about cars. They didn't have to know much about cars. But they could get trace information very easily. Just a few years ago, this would have taken a long time to create. It would have taken several months of planning, a lot of effort. Uh, but this was, was doable very easily. Um, there's a number of community-created community applications that have come out of OpenXC. Um, I did share with you the shift knob example. That was quite interesting. I'm going to share one more with you. Unfortunately, this is fun if we can get the audio working for this. Let's see, because it's about music. Let, let, me, let me see if this works.
Okay, so this was actually a lot of fun. I don't know. I think it came through. You could hear it. Okay. So the main point here is that, that cars can be a lot of fun. There's one billion of these cars around the planet. And if you can couple car data with some other data, you can do a lot. You can do a lot for traffic congestion. You can do a lot for air quality. You can do a lot for public safety. You can do a lot for just fun and entertainment also. So that's the point I'm trying to make. And to do that, you don't have to invest in high-tech tools. What OpenXC offers is an open source toolkit, right? So I think that's, that's the main, main point. Um, I also mentioned the, the natural growth of ecosystems, whether it's through GitHub or whether it's through the courses you can learn online or whether it's through funding mechanisms or maker spaces. You find plenty of opportunities to grow your idea, shape your idea, and fund your idea, and then eventually make it a product if you so desire. Uh, I, I've been mentioning rain for a few minutes, so I do want to just sort of close the, the discussion with rain and why I think it's sort of an important um, area to sort of consider in the context of repurposing actuators and sensors that you have in cars. So if you take a wiper blade, and are somehow able to record the fact that it's raining. Um, wiper blades are very, very reliable sources of rain detection. If you have an automatic uh, rain, detects, rain or water detection system, it comes on by itself. But most of the time, when it's manual, you turn it on. If it's misbehaving, you turn it off, the automatic system. But it's a very good indicator of the fact that there's local rain. If you can communicate that information to the back end, there's a very powerful value associated with that. And one of the European Union studies showed that there's something between a 4 to 25% fuel saving that can come by having that information. And that's a tremendous amount of, of, of fuel uh, and energy saving. Um, so there's a number of things that can be done uh, by having information to, to cars. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of, lot of reasons to build with cars as open source platforms. Um, this was a study done in Manhattan again where three cars were going around the city of New York. Um, and based on where the cars were, we could see where it was raining. So this was in one city, where in 
two of the streets there was no rain, but one street there was rain. So you could get very fine granularity on whether there was rain or not. And it's very, very difficult to do that unless you have some sensors like, like wiper blades in this case. So I've, I've already shared with you Zach's story uh, with the haptic shift knob. And I might come back to play that because we didn't have sound the last time around. Uh, but essentially all of Zach's material um, are available and, and um, that's okay, um, are on the web. You can, as I said, they're on GitHub. Um, you can see all the parts that were sourced were from the open source. Um, you can make these parts yourself, you can modify them, do what you want to, and then bring them together in interesting ways. Um, what OpenXC offers is a set of accessories um, and interfaces to the vehicle to get data out of the car. This is an example of what is available. You can build your own, of course, but you can also get um, accessories or, or um, onboard diagnostics um, vehicle interfaces uh, commercially. There's ways to assemble this. All this information is, is available on the OpenXC site, um, and you can go off and, uh, and create your own um, applications. Uh, people have created a number of different applications. Um, what we have done is, uh, through OpenXC, expose the number of signals in cars. And by exposing that, this is being used not just for rapid prototyping and for building, uh, testing concepts, but it's also being used in universities for education, in classroom for instruction. So if you're taking a class in computer science or programming or data analysis and, and data analytics, you can get data from cars um, and, and you can actually do something that's, uh, that's very uh, tied to a real world problem. Um, so there's been a number of ways by which we have made um, all this um, open. And I'll just uh, sort of go back now uh, for a minute and, and play Zach's um, video clip. But before I do that, I just want to mention that in addition to using open source platforms, we've been using a number of crowdsourced platforms um, to look at how the world looks at mobility problems. In a number of uh, regions around the world, we have posed uh, these crowdsource problems. Um, and we've got some very, very interesting applications coming out of that. Um, as you can see, we've gone essentially all around the world. Um, and right here in Mexico, uh, we have uh, an interesting uh, project that's underway. It's a crowdsourced uh, uh, challenge. And, and um, if you're ready, you, know, you still have some time to go uh, create, a, create an application. So let me try playing this and see if this works out. Thank you. So let me, um, I'll stop here and I want to say um, um, Vicentios and Nuestro Stand. Gracias. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me play the one video that we didn't hear the audio on. Go back to slide. one? Yeah?
you, folks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Eh, ¿Tienen preguntas para Prasad? Uh, I have a question regarding to what is the risk to do this open source? Because uh, I, I don't know, I, I only see the, the pictures and, and I can see that uh, some persons uh, when uh, reach some, some speed uh, started a, a, a music and I don't know if, if the user uh, take some uh, signals to do this or uh, if for um, if, if this behavior uh, could be be some uh, risk to, to the security for the car right so so the question is um why do we open source when there could be security issues and, and problems, right? And yes. Right. So, yeah, so a car is like any automobile, any, any product that's out in the consumer world, especially cars uh, and products that can cause uh, potential death, right, uh, are tightly regulated for safety reasons, also for emissions reasons. But between safety and emissions, there's a lot of creativity that can come in to add value to platforms. When you open source, it doesn't mean that you lose security. What, it, what you do is that you actually gain a wide number of users and developers who know about cars. And in that large population, you might always find someone who could do something that, that's not so good. But most people will be doing something that's very good. And so we get a larger access to developers. Um, we get a larger um, and a more, um, more effective way of educating the next generation of students. If you have to learn about cars, to then do the right thing about cars, it's very hard to exchange proprietary information. If everything is closed, it becomes very hard to educate people about it. Um, it's of course very important to secure cars and secure, like it's like any other cyber physical system. You have to secure it, but you don't secure it by keeping it closed. You secure it by having the foundational building blocks available to everyone so that everyone gets more educated and then the good guys who come and help you when you have cyber security problems are in fact coming from the community that you have helped educate. What about the, the another companies? For, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, BMW, uh -huh. or, uh, is a uh, enemy or, or could, this, these brands could be take this like, this like uh, advantage to? Um, yeah, so the question is, will, will your competitor take advantage? So the biggest focus for us is not our enemies. I wouldn't call BMW our enemy. I would say our consumers are the people we want to build a strong tie with. And so when we want to do that, building a strong user experience is important. And when we build a user experience, we differentiate. We don't make things public, right, at the user experience level. How we design the application, especially in, in our case, as you saw, we have a platform that allows you to go build products. That's our AppLink platform. We have something called SDL that allows you to build um, our, our platforms, applications for other car makers. OpenXC allows you to build rapid prototypes and allows you to experiment. If we want to create products, we have a different path. And that path is focused on creating a very strong user experience. It frankly doesn't matter who builds some of the enabling technologies. The enabling technologies can be open. If you take your favorite Android platform, or your favorite iOS platform, more than 60% of the enabling code is open source. How is Apple able to differentiate itself from a Google, from an I/O, from an Android phone? They compete too, right? They don't compete by having 100% of their code closed. If they did, it would be unaffordable to the business, right? So you want to have 90, 60, 70% most of your code open sourced, and you want to focus on where you can build a strong user experience, right? 
question. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's different in the US, uh, but how do you get a patent uh, from a repository of GitHub? Uh, pardon me, how do you get a person? Uh, a patent. A project? Uh huh. The protection of something that is in GitHub. Uh, because I saw that you got a patent. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, good. So the question is how do you get a patent, is it? Please. And especially when it's an open source? So the two are very different. So the patent, a patent is really defined by lawyers and, and it gives you a right on your intellectual property. So, yeah, go ahead. Is someone, uh, can someone download uh, the repository on GitHub and oh, yeah. you so, get some money every no, time so, so here's what it is. The patent tells, in this case, I'll, I'll use a specific example. Zach Nelson has a patent on the shift knob. He and his friends, his co-inventors. They, what it says is the United States government, the Patent and Trademark Office, gives him the title as the inventor. Right? That's all it says. Now, the title has been, the patent has been assigned to Ford Motor Company, and Ford Motor Company, by placing the, allowing Zach to play his code in GitHub, has essentially given that away because we've placed everything on OpenXC under the Creative Commons attribution. The two are very different. It's still, Zach is still the inventor of that, but you don't have to pay any royalty to access the GitHub code. You don't have to sign any documents because it's placed under the Creative Commons attribution and under the terms and conditions of GitHub. The code is, is offered to you under, under BSD licensing and all the hardware is offered to you under the open source hardware framework. So there's no fine print there. It's for you to take, modify, improve, sell, get rich if you want to. Otra pregunta en español. Gracias, good night. Uh, if you consider to the cryptic commons is a, a good idea for the open resources? Yeah, the, the creative commons? Oh, yeah, so I think I firmly believe the creative commons was created yeah. because we had problems with things that were locked down too early. Well, they, I have to the six different licenses. It's very complicated for, for developers to go do things, right? So what you want is the create, to use the Creative Commons where it's appropriate to use the Creative Commons, to understand, get yourself educated, try rapid prototyping on things, speak about what you've done so you can get help from others. If you go to Zach's YouTube clip, he has about 315,000 followers. 315,000 okay. views on his YouTube clip, which is a pretty big deal. Okay. Uh, I don't have access to internet, but if I could get to it, you can, you can do it on your phones. Just type in haptic shift knob and you'll see on the YouTube clip, Zach has about 315,000 views, okay. right? So 1% of that is about 3,000. So he has about 3,000 people who work with him. That's happened because of the Creative Commons. If Zach had locked things up and he, was he would have been busy signing contracts and licenses, and maybe would have had 10 or 15 people talking to him. Thank you. Right? So it's very important to do that. Hi. Do you see, uh, you know, in the near future, that uh, other level of OBD stuff will be open for uh, for an open stacks or something like that? Like for now, we have networking open stacks already, security open stacks already. So do you see in the near future that we're going to be able to access to the full code? Because right now it's like a only only body stuff, not really gear or a powertrain or stuff. Yeah, so I don't, I can't speak about the future in terms of what each firm will do and each firm will not do. That's a proprietary decision that's made, right? But I, I really think that what we have open is pretty good and exciting now. If things are closed, they usually close for a couple of reasons. Oftentimes it has to do with regulation and safety. It has to do with liability. It has to do with you know who pays when something wrong happens you know from a, a warranty standpoint. So there's some serious considerations that go into making data available, um, and so those decisions have to be made. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Gracias.
Gracias.